Hey, hello again. Happy Sunday. We're on the ground here at uh, Fuzhou, China. We're heading up the coast to Shanghai. And if things look a little bit weird to you, they look a little bit weird to me, too. Uh, everything looks like it's uh, being shot with uh, a tobacco filter or a little bit warm white balance. Or if you're of a certain age and you remember a lot of movies from the 70s, there was a film stock that was in wide use, Eastman Color Negative Film Type 5254, and this may remind you of the color rendering with a little bit of extra warmth added in. This is Rex, what am I saying Rex? This is Active Sky 2016 and Active Sky's clouds and colors and things, and I haven't yet figured it out exactly. But um, I'm probably doing something wrong, and it's giving me a kind of nostalgic, kind of weird-ass look. But uh, this is, well, this is Diamonds Are Forever, and this is shot on 52-54. There are a lot of other films that were shot on it that, uh, that have a sort of characteristic look, in addition to the look that uh, the directors and the uh, director of photography was trying to get. But... Uh, Things like uh, Patton and the Sting, and uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and The Godfather especially. I mean, if you look at The Godfather, and you look at the look that, uh, that uh, Francis Coppola got with it, this is obviously a little bit uh, juiced up. It's a little bit overgraded here. And it's a little oversaturated in the clip, but you get the idea. This is a film stock that became obsolete in the 19, mid 1970s. And yet, and yet, when you ask filmmakers who shoot film if they'd ever like to see one film stock resurrected, they say this is probably it. These days, you can recreate the look. Uh, well, you can recreate the look in Prepared, apparently, but you can recreate the look in Final Cut or Premiere or uh, any of the uh, uh, color grading plugins that have uh, film stock additions to them. Let me just, I'm going to try something right here. Let me see if I have to reload the sim. This is Active Sky Cloud Art, and I don't really want, let's try this. Let's try refreshing. So activate theme refreshing. Let's see. Change with this theme. Yes. Please wait. This might take a while. Installed. Activated. And uh, looks like crap. All right. Let's try Tempest. Activate theme. Tempest. This is some wild stuff, but uh, all right, we'll wait for that to take. Uh, well, it kind of all looks like crap. Um, I wonder if it's because I did something with my shaders in prepared, and I probably did, and it's probably my fault. Anyway, let's get buttoned up here. Let's get going. Take this opportunity to show you a little bit of how to work the FMC or FMS in the plane. Ignore the music. What we've done already, there are two of them by the way, and they are independent. You can store different flight plans in them. And that's not the standard way to do it. You wouldn't store two flight plans uh, and switch over. It would, it would certainly make things faster, but generally speaking you would cross fill so that you've got identical flight plans. So in case one of them breaks, you've got the other one. Anyway, I've already put in our departing airport Fuzhou, and I've already put in Shanghai Pudong as our arrival airport, and I've already put in a SID here. The SID put in, let me get rid of this crap, uh, the SID I've put in is this. It's the uh, Godfather 3 SID, which of course leads nowhere. Um, 
it is this one right here departing runway 3 taking us to the north uh, DS 63k which is gonna take us out to Rupux or Rupux and from there we're going to uh, join an airway and I'll show you how to add an airway we're going to join the uh, Bravo 221 airway and take it to uh, the Dongshan VOR and then from there proceed direct to this beacon which will get us onto a star and the star will lead us onto an ILS approach because things are starting to get crappy in Shanghai which is good which will be fun all right so how do you add an airway because what you could do is you could go Rupex and then Dongshan and here let, let's continue this airway let's let's fly it to uh, Shenzhou and now you've got this long airway here and uh, well what are you gonna do you could input every single one of these points and you'd get essentially the same thing but why would you want to do that so uh, what we'll do is instead we'll go into list actually we'll move our cursor or move our line select key to the one where we want to add it go to list and then choose airway and there is only one airway from uh, Rupix and that's B221 so you choose it now watch what happens it'll ask you where you want to exit it so uh, we want to exit at Shenzhou SHZ or uh, if uh, if you're uh, frugal that would be uh, Sierra Hotel Zulu and again the gratuitous frugal crack for no reason uh, but we'll choose it nonetheless whatever you want to call it we'll choose it and now if you look our FMS has started us at Rupix and there's DST and there's uh, Riemann and there is uh, Shangzhou so there we're done so now we want to go to uh, well you know what we could input uh, Li uh, which is BK or since it's part of the star let's see if we get it automatically and the star we're looking for is the BK for this uh, 12 alpha so now you would think well you go to list and now it's gonna list SIDS and stars that would make sense but that's not the case instead what you do is go to menu why you do that I don't know it's not exactly uh, sensical but this is the universal FMS and the universal FMS is acknowledged to be universally weird but it works and it works nicely so go to menu choose arrive we are going to come in on what did I say did I say 17 right well I didn't say it to you but did I say it to myself yes 17 right assuming the weather holds and uh, choose that and now we have this whole list of stars five pages worth so we're gonna go BK 12 alpha that's number 14 now you'd think also you could just hit a corresponding line select key but you can see there are more listings than there are keys so uh, the other thing is that the sentence structure or the grammar of the universal FMS is reversed from the uh, Honeywells and Collinses and things that uh, that are used in uh, Boeing and Airbus airliners um, in that you enter the item and then you hit the line select key where you want to put it in this you hit the line select key of where you want something to go and then you make your choice so uh, we do want that and we do hit enter and I don't think we're going to need a transition. Let's choose an approach right now. And we want the uh, 17 ILS RNAV Zulu. So we'll choose number two and hit enter. 
And the transition we want is, just to make it nice and convenient, we want to pick a transition that um, our star is close to. So we can uh, do uh, PD038, and there it is right there, number three. It's interesting, there is a uh, VOR that's supposed to be here, but it's not on the chart, so maybe it's been decommissioned in the time since this chart has been current, and I'm not sure what the currency on this is. This is copyright 2015, and yeah, November 2015 and this is Navigraph's charts. Their database is up to date, but their charts are not unbelievably so. Uh, more so for the United States and Canada and Europe, less so for the rest of the world. But there you have it. All right, so PD038, we go back to our flight plan, and now we see there is the no link, which is the same as a disconnect between our en route and our star, so we'll delete that. Okay, there's the beginning of our star, BK. And here are the intermediate points. And here is the no link between the end of the uh, star and the beginning of the approach, the initial approach fix. Get rid of that. Now, there's another no link here. We acknowledge that, but don't get rid of it. If we don't acknowledge it, for some weird reason peculiar to the universal uh, FMS, it will not display altitudes and restrictions and so forth. So we'll just go over them, make sure they're sane, and they appear to be. Make sure there are no duplicates. The only duplicate there generally is, is this. Right before the beginning of the uh, final approach fix, you get what's called a fix sandwich in this FMS. There it is, PD-201 at line 20. And here it is at 22. Do not delete those. It's, it wreaks havoc. It, it won't sequence the approach properly if you do. Um, it's just a quirk. It's not a simism, it is actually a dashism, and it's a dashism, I think, peculiar to this particular version of the Universal um, FMS. There are newer versions that do fancier things, but this is based on a, uh, not the earliest one, but a fairly early one. Anyway, we've gotten our weather. Um, what I do want to do is uh, get our V-speeds set up. We're running here with the... Uh, with the APU on. So we're burning a little bit of fuel. Go into our um, perf page, not our perf page, our fuel page. That's another thing. Instead of the weight being in the perf page, the weight is on the fuel page. But all right, that's fine. So 63854, convert that to kilograms because my little tool works in kilograms. Uh, this is Windows 10, and that's why everything is big and stupid looking. God, I wish all this stuff ran on a Mac, but no such luck. Um, I mean, even when, when the Windows stuff is better and improved and less atrocious, it's still atrocious and idiotic and redundant and weird. All right, so uh, what is it, 63852? I mean, if you look at Outlook and you compare it and you look at the settings and options, all I wanted to do was set it so that when I uh, move my cursor over a header, the... Um, it gets marked as read, and, and you need to adjust the time for that. And the way you do that is you don't go into general, you don't go into mail, and there is nothing for message reading. 
Uh, I mean, look at all these options. Instead, you go into, it says Outlook Paints customize how items are marked as red when using the reading pane. This doesn't let you choose between different layouts of reading panes. This simply, and they could make it as a subhead right here, exposed on the first level. Instead, this is merely a gateway to another pop-up that lets you choose how you read your messages. Um, it is utterly impenetrable, um, this whole setup. And if you look here, I have simplified all my ribbons and things by stripping stuff out of them. There's still stuff I can't strip out of this. And this is supposed to be good stuff, but this is bullshit. All right, sorry. Um, anyway, so uh, 63... Uh, you see what I've, I've gone and done? I've gone on a rant, and I've totally erased my uh, 63845. That is not Windows. That's, that's stupid, and that's me. Uh, divided by 2.2 .2 equals 29020. So go back into our tool here. 29020. All right, and we're going to take off of flaps 10 and top calculate. There we go. All right. <laughs> Give us a margin of 5,000 feet. That's how long this runway is. All right, 124, 124, 125. So the way you deal with that is again, you hit select for the speed bug. One twenty-four. Yeah, apologies for the music. I haven't deleted that yet on my reinstall. One twenty-five. Now, if you dilly dally with this, it'll just um, uh, pop out of the adjust mode, and now the adjustments don't work. You have to hit select again. So. Let's see, V Fry 136, 157. So select, 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 select. 136 and 157. All right, so we've got our route, we've got our V speeds. I would put them on the first officer's side, but come on. Come on now. We're not going to bother with that. I've got um, the captain side set up to run off of FMS-1 and the first officer side off of NAV-2 so I can uh, keep my uh, VOR navigation, especially my ILS, just right there so I can glance over to it without having to toggle modes or without having to interpret an RMI needle. But I am going to set my green RMI needle, which is not showing here because I've got nothing tuned into VOR2. My white one to VOR1. I'm going to just start up the auto feather test and let it uh, run through its thing. And uh, let's just check our um, SID for any restrictions. So there we go. SID runway 3. i got to delete this music. All right. We just have to be at 2960 or above by there, which is DME. About 15. And then by DME 30, or about 30 miles. It's actually not DM8, it's 30 miles. Uh, leg length or track length, uh, we have to be at 6,000 feet. That is not going to be a problem. And looks like we've got no limitations from there. And it's raining. Cool. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll uh, set 6,000 feet at the moment. Oh, as a matter of fact. 
since our our restrictions are all above, so we're going to set our cruising altitude, flight level 250, set runway heading, which is 030. Very neat and precise with the magnetic variance. I have to check. I forget whether magnetic variance is greater in farther north latitudes than it is in uh, equatorial latitudes. I will bet you it is. Uh, instinctively. Anyway, let's just make sure everything is set up and ready to go. Our bus tie is still tied. Our uh, APU is running. We're going to start off the APU. Um, we're not in Russia, so I'm not going to change the altimeter units to feet and meters. Our transition altitude is 10,000 feet here. Our landing altitude is set 500 feet above field. Uh, bleeds are normal at the moment. And our cabin temperature is a little chilly. Turn on our signs. And change our lights to red. And let's see what our little caution is. All right. Nothing as far as I can tell. Let's see what it looks like outside. Oh, lovely. Okay, little uh, sun showers. Wow. Look at these clouds. Uh, these are... Uh, they may be weirdly colored, and that's probably my fault, but look at these things. And look at the gradation in them. And <laughs> look at the lightning. All right, cool. All right, so we're going to be pushing back uh, nose right. And the procedure is pretty simple. We're uh, going to turn our bleed air off. Keep our bleeds to... No, oh, you know what? We need the... Need the APU bleed on to start. You know what? I don't remember, and I'm going to have to check that. Um, in the 737, you need the bleed air on to start, obviously. Don't know if you do on this. I think you do. What it does is it uh, turns off... Uh, tell you, this is, this is where I am really rusty. Those bleeds, that's why our temperature is screwy. These bleeds should be off, the engine bleeds that is. The APU bleed should be on, and now it is, and it, it, if, watch, it goes off when these bleeds are on, and of course these bleeds are not doing anything. I mean, uh, pardon me, these packs. So now, there we go. These are the bleeds. These are the packs. God, I'll tell you what. Been far too long out of this airplane, and uh, I'm going to make up for it, believe you me. All right, so now our bleeds are running. Our start selector is on number two. We are going to check to make sure that our nose gear steering is off, and it is. That's not going to do anything, but that's okay. We're going to call for a push and remove the parking brake and then start up. And we're going to start up by hitting the start button and then moving the condition lever to start and feather. Uh, unlike on a 737, we don't have to wait until we get a certain number of uh, revolutions. The computer takes care of it. So uh, we go to uh, data and services. I'll cross fill in one second. Let's just uh, get pushed back and start it up here. Uh, push back to the right. Well, we are ready for push back. We are ready now. Please release parking brake. Okay, parking brake is released. Now listen to what happens with uh, the bleeds. Parking brakes released. Pushing back now. We are clear to start the engine number two. 
Okay, so we hit start. We shoot down to here. Move that lever up, and you notice how the air conditioning stops. And let's see if we're going to hit anything. All right, not so far. So far, so good. But we will stop the push right about... Let's see what it does. No, it's just going to keep turning us. Okay. Okay, we've got starter cut out there. Set the parking brake. Turn this on. Parking brake set. Can you get clearance at number one? Okay, and now we start number one. And look at that go. The, uh, the Majestic Mighty Dash, as you know, has an external flight model and engine model, courtesy of um, the... Um, A simulator engine called uh, JSB Sim, which is a descendant of a NASA flight simulator called Lark Sim, and uh, it does icing better. It does turboprops much, much better, and it's pretty damn good for performance too. We'll set flaps 10. We'll kill that caution there. We'll cross fill our fuel. Cross fill our flight plan. Turn on our. Well, you know what? We're going to wait for that because we don't have uh, the engines turning to do that. But we're going to advance our condition levers on number two to full. And because everything else is stable here, you can see these temperatures are now stable. We're going to also do the same for engine one, and, and what is going to happen now is our hydraulics now are all running. Our bleeds are now running. Our electricity is now running. Turn off the main bus tie. Turn off our APU. Turn on our heats. There we go. Going to turn off ice protection for the moment, but that's about it. Uh, we've already tested our caution lights before you got on, and our electricals and generatorables are all right. And now we can turn on our aux fuel pump and it lights up because now there's enough engine turning to turn it. Same with the standby hydraulics and the power transfer unit. We're going to test this. We're going to watch that rise. Kill that. Watch it fall. Guard it. And there we go with that. We are going to uh, turn our uh, radar to standby. And uh, we're going to squawk. And we're going to turn our uh, TCAS to auto. All right. We're going to check our trim. We're going to run that down just a little bit there. You do the, this airplane does not like too much nose up trim, no matter how heavy you make it. All right. We're going to make our rudder trim about 10 units to the right. And that will counteract the brutal, brutal torque that these Pratt & Whitney PW150As make. All right. And we're going to start to taxi. This means the props are still in the beta range. I'm glancing over right here, and you notice that these are yellow. What that means, and I'm just going to back off the power a little bit, 
is that the bleeds are in the wrong mode for takeoff. So there we go. Now they're in min, and now look what happens. That turns white. So that's a little sanity check, I suppose you'd call it. And we're going to uh, taxi out to runway three and get ready to fly into a world. I do mean a world of hurt. Um, I've got the first officer showing radar. So what I'll do is I'll flip mine over to terrain. She can monitor the weather and I can look over her shoulder. Only because I've got my seat farther back, but that's only because I'm a great big galoot. And while she's not a little slip of a thing, she's not six foot five. And if she is, more power to her. All right, so there we go. Going to Taxiway Alpha, which seems to make sense considering it takes us to the main runway. This is a single strip airport. And I can only imagine that these days it's busy as hell. I think Fuzhou is, I don't know, at, at I don't think it's 10 million people, but it's big. And that is the amazing thing about China uh, that, well, it's amazing unless you're Chinese, in which case you know this already. But um, a gentle reminder to Americans, um, China has got more cities. <laughs> I think China's got more cities with a million people or more than we've got cities. Um, there are at least a half a dozen cities in China that you have probably never heard of that are as big or bigger than New York. It, it's a very, very, very impressive thing. I mean, I'm a New Yorker and we've got, and New York population is growing. I think we've got about 8.7 million people now, which is an all-time record for New York. And the metropolitan area has probably got about 20 if you if you go 100 miles around it. But all that said, I mean, you know, Shanghai is, what, 15 million people? Um, Hong Kong is some colossal number. Uh, Beijing is enormous. Shenzhen is giant. Um, it's... it's it's quite an amazing thing, so I, uh, I don't pretend for a minute to know any of it, and as soon as I can, I'm going to travel there and uh, get to know it. Fortunately, there is such an enormously large population now from China, from all corners of China here in New York, that at least when it comes to things like eating, um, if I want... Uh, Fuzhou cuisine, I can get it. If I want Shanghai Hainese, I can certainly get it. If I can, if I want Chinese Muslim stuff, I can get it. Um, there is all manner of really amazing stuff here. But um, and for the first time, I think since the beginning of the Chinese migration to New York, at least, I believe Mandarin is more highly spoken than Cantonese. Initially, a lot of Chinese Americans came from Canton province. And um, hence in New York's first Chinatown, which is downtown, uh, the primary language is Cantonese, or was. And in the big, somewhat newer Chinatown, which is out in, in Flushing, out in Queens, the primary language with a lot of other dialects language, the primary dialect with a lot of other regional dialects sprinkled in is um, is Mandarin. So you get a whole panoply of stuff, I guess you'd, you'd say, um, whereas you didn't before. And now we've got a whole panoply of weather, it seems. So just see if we can make this work. And of course our skies are kind of purple and brown 
but uh, um, wow, we're pretty much um, surrounded by thunder storms. So let's get our plan of action going here. It's going to uh, set the parking brake, turn off the gust lock, kill that caution, check our trims and kill that again, check our flaps, that is good. Transponder is squawking and our um, set this to terrain, so now I've got terrain on mine and she's got weather on hers. We'll turn the radar on and I don't even want to know what we're going to see. We'll just tilt it upwards a little bit so that we can uh, see what uh, we're getting into here. All right, now that's a test pattern, and it does that sometimes. It sometimes gets stuck in test, and the way you get out of that is you turn it back to standby and off, and you turn it back on. And now it says weather on, and all right. We'll see what we can see. Terrain all around us. That's fine. We're going to be actually going to the right, not to the left. And looks like low clouds and marine layer and crap there. Um, all right. Got our pumps and auxes set. Turn our landing lights on. Turn our taxi lights off. Heats are on. Bus tie is off. APU is off. Turn these to white. Turn our logo light on. Smoking signs are off. Bleeds are on, on and min. And um, me thinks we're ready to go. We're going to take off end top power, which is 90%. Our speeds are bugged. We'll set toga and heading select. For the moment, runway heading is set right there, 030. Heading select, go around mode, hence our bar here and our displaced bar there, because we're obviously not at runway heading. And everything else looks good to go. Uh, the other thing that having an external flight model helps with in this airplane is you don't have the ground friction bug that you do in standard airplanes in FSX or P3D. It means it rolls normally or it rolls more or less the way a plane really rolls. Imagine that. All right, get ourselves lined up. We see the numerals 0 and 3, so we are on runway 03. We confirm it by looking at our runway heading. We look at our course here. We look over at the radar here. And, um, well, it looks like actually our star, Sid, I'm sorry, is going to just barely take us in the right direction. We might have to divert a little bit here, but it looks like we've got a momentary hole in the crap. So uh, let's take advantage of it, shall we? Uh, I've also got, by the way, an acceleration altitude set here. And, um, wow, high drama here at Fuzhou. Okay, auto feather is armed. Takeoff power is set. Props are behaving as they should. There's 80 knots. And we're looking for 124, not 131. I'm not sure how that got set that way, but that's okay. Probably nudged it. Okay. Rotate smoothly up to the bar. Belly up to the bar there. Wait for confirmation of positive rate. And we have it. Gear up. Going to LNAV mode. And we're going to actually 
Whoa, there's a downdraft. Um, and we are going to expect to get hammered here. We already are. Okay. Oh, boy. All right, well, I've already got us in trouble, and that's because my... Uh, let's see if I can fix that right now. Nope. My... Um, my prop controller is too sensitive, again. And you notice how this has gone to M-top, and this is at max climb. All right, let's set them both to M-top. See if I can set this down now to, I'm sorry, to N-top. Okay, now we'll bring them both down. All right, so one of them is not cooperating, and the way we get around that is by restarting the engine. So, at the moment, let's crank in a little bit of extra right trim. Let's start to bring up our flaps. We are going to continue to climb. I have to recalibrate my, my controllers. Okay, there we go. It is still a pleasure to hand fly. And, oh boy, we are just flying into the shit, aren't we? I'm just going to cycle this again, see if I can get it to cooperate. Well, I can get it to act up is what I can get it to do. Alright, so we've got a prop controller failure. And the best way to deal with it would be to level off right here and continue to fly <laughs> our SID. So let's do that. Let's just hold our altitude, put in the autopilot, let it level us off, pick up some speed, navigate around this storm, and then figure out what to do with our engines. And we've got some ice, so we'll put on our ice protection. And we'll open up our doors. Now, I think what we can do is, and I'm going to do it right now, start to come back on our power just a little bit. And I might be able to get this thing running again properly if I um, reduce the uh, number two engine, which is the one that's wonky, to flight idle and see if I can... Uh, I can make it work. Now this of course is going to reduce our climb performance, but that doesn't matter because we're not climbing. However, we are in the middle of a storm, which is not good. And we are going to possibly get a little bit blasted. I think we're below it, but let me just uh, tilt this thing straight ahead and see what it has to show us. And I'm just going to retrim the rudder here, bring in a little more power. That's about as fast as I want to go. All right, well, this is not promising, but let's see if we can get this engine going. I'm just going to creep this down until it gets to about 1%. Torque, there we go. And now I'm going to move it up to end top here and now I'm gonna try to reduce it there and it works alright so this one can go to max climb I'm just gonna bring it up very slowly here and I'll adjust my rudder trim in a minute and let's start Climbing again, go into IAS mode, bring in the power, and we're going to start going up. 
There we go. And retrim, because now we've got that big old gob of power from... And look at how close we are skirting this. Okay. I think what we're going to do in a second is pop into heading select mode. No, you know what? Let me show you how to use the cross-track function. First, let me just make sure we've got the power we need. Everything is fine. Our cautions are clear. Let's turn off auto feather now. We don't need it. All right, so here's, we want to go about two miles to the right here. So let's pop this up, go to nav. Uh, no, don't go to nav. Go to menu. All right, hang on. Flight plan, menu. Oh, yeah, go to nav. Maneuver. S, cross track. Okay, we want to go right. So, we want to go right, 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 three miles. Okay, enter. Now, watch what happens. We're turning, you see? And we're turning away from the storm. Well, we're turning towards another storm. And we are going to go outbound three miles. Let's make it two miles. Okay, see right there? Select this line. Two, O, oh, boom. Okay, so we go two miles. And we are just about two miles already. 1.1. 1 .1. So we are now 0.9 left of our deviated track. Now you see we're going to make this perfectly parallel to our previous track, and that is going to get us around that mofo right there. However, in a second, we're going to run into, uh, we might run into this mofo over here. Um, so, let's take a look. Right now, we are, you see, we're going to skate. We just skated past this one, and now we're going to skate past this one if we're lucky and maybe get above this one. So, uh, in, in the real world, you might request a deviation based on a heading, or you might, holy crap, this looks good. Or you might request a deviation uh, of so-and-so miles um, left or right of track, and that looks pretty damn good. Jesus, look at this. Look at that. Alright, we're above our transition altitude, so let me just uh, deal with this first. Okay, set standard there. Do the flight simulator thing. And uh, turn off our lights check our pressurization, which is the more important thing, and our cabin is at a comfy uh, two and a half thousand feet, and in the meantime, let's just um, that's pretty good, and, and you, you look at the transitions down here, and the, the uh, semi-transparency here, and there um, that's pretty damn amazing all right, so now it's taking us back on the track because um, the significant um, restriction on this is that it will only do it per leg. It will not, for instance, if you set right two miles, left two miles, fly you your entire flight plan to the right or the left by two miles. It is limited, and I don't know whether it's limited to uh, save you from doing something stupid or it's just limited because it just is to um, leg by leg and look at this they got a coastal rail railway here a nice long causeway I'm guessing it's a coastal railway and not a coastal road because it is at water level the whole way and the roadway goes up over those hills so I'm guessing that's that's a railroad but I, I don't know for sure 
All right, so notice we're coming back on our track. And we are going upstairs pretty quickly. And our fuel is a little bit uh, tipsy, so I'm going to uh, cross-feed some fuel to this side. I don't know whether it is normal to do this in flight. I know with 737 it's absolutely not done in flight. 727, I don't know. And in any case, they even each other out automatically. Of course, in some propeller airplanes, smaller GA airplanes, um, you just manually switch tanks. And you generally don't draw from both in case of the very odd and unusual um, possibility that your um, fuel is contaminated on one side but not the other. Of course, if you fill both sides at the same time, it's, it's not going to, you're going to obviously contaminate both. But I suppose if the source of contamination is something deteriorating in one or the other tank, you would not want to um, have no source of clean fuel to use if you needed it. I guess that's the rationale. I don't know how that bears out in, in the real, real world, but uh, it makes, uh, makes intellectual sense at least. We're climbing fairly slowly, or at a, at a slow airspeed, but you see our true airspeed is going up, obviously, because the air is getting thinner, so we're actually going faster. And um, our ground speed is reasonably healthy, and we don't have too terrible a headwind to deal with, which is nice. If you're flying across the United States, and probably just about any place else, uh, east to west or west to east, you know full well, well, for instance, you fly New York to San Francisco, it's six hours fly San Francisco to New York, it's five hours or, or less, so, you know, it's, uh, it's quite the difference. And thank goodness we have avoided the uh, weather nasties. But I, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply impressed with, uh, with this. And uh, the frame rates seem um, damn healthy. These, uh, these clouds I've selected are uh, not the least resolvatory clouds, which are 512K uh, textures. These are 1024 textures. It, in clouds, it's less important than ground terrain because clouds are, by their nature, a little bit soft and puffy and diffuse. And you, obviously, since they're shifting clouds of condensed uh, vapor, they don't... Um, it's, it's not like crystallized rock. So um, if they're a little bit nebulous... Oh, wait a minute. That means cloud-like. If they're a little bit nebulous, that's exactly the way they're supposed to be. So it's not always a disadvantage to have fairly low-res clouds because in a cloud that looks, say, like that, here, let's zoom in on a little bit, um, you don't have features that are at tiny, tiny distances that would be um, resolved or not resolved, um, you know, depending on, on, on pixel size so much. Here, with these little edges here, a little bit more, and here with these wisps, a little bit more, but by and large, not so much. And the Achilles heel, as always with uh, FSX and P3D, is rendering stuff in the distance. You notice that if you look at it, you can see it pop in and render, but a lot of the time, if you look at things like roads and railroads, they're, you know, I mean, you can navigate by them, but they look like crap. And, well, that looks like crap. You know. So, but it's a trade-off. It's always a trade-off. Let's go down to our perf page. And uh, as we do that, we can technically wait till you get to cruising altitude to do these, but some operators, you do it... Uh, shortly after takeoff. I don't know which one 
Bombardier recommends or prefers, but I imagine it doesn't matter much unless something's going to break. And if something's going to break way up here, you can always turn them on. You're not in any critical phase of flight. Also, if something breaks up here, here let's put in our airports here. Are there any airports nearby? I wonder. Not showing any, but that could be simply because of lack of database data because of where we are in the world. But ordinarily, um, you wouldn't be more than, uh, well, at the altitude we're at, you could glide in the United States probably to most suitable airports for this airplane. So, anyway, just look at our perf page for a moment. We're burning 2,040 pounds of fuel per hour total in this climb. And let's see. We're estimated at the rate we're burning this fuel to have an hour and eight minutes of fuel over Shanghai. In fact, once we get up to cruise, this is going to drop down to about uh, 1,800 uh, total per hour. So that is going to improve. And once we get into our descent, it's going to improve still more. So all told, probably we will arrive at... Um, We'll probably arrive at Shanghai with enough fuel to divert 45 minutes and hold for about a half an hour. So we'll have plenty of time to shoot many, many approaches. And speaking of which, speaking of which, I'll step on my microphone cable and yank it out of my headset. Um, Okay, can you hear me now? I hope so. All right, speaking of which, let's, um, let's brief our arrival. First check the weather in Shanghai. It is altimeter 1005. We'll set that in our standby. Come on, click. There you go, 1005. At the moment, winds are... All right. It's going to be a, a crosswind from our left. That should be fun. And uh, let's see. Broken 2300. Broken 1600. Should be interesting. And. Thunderstorms, too. Okay, good. Fun. Let's just see if uh, Active Sky agrees with it, because that's what's going to give us our weather. So, uh, ZSPD. Cloudy wind, a little higher, 12 knots, broken 2300, that agrees. Temperature 32, dew point 26, F falling altimeter, all right. Should be interesting. All right, what we will do is uh, at least... Okay, we're a thousand away. Make sure out cell is selected, and it is. I'm going to move my props gingerly down to max cruise. And we're only climbing at 500 feet per minute, so well, what I'll do is I'll just gently nudge our speed up just a little bit. So now we will level off gently. gently. There we go. 
All right. Airport. ZSPD. Shanghai Pudong. Runway 17 right. Get weather. Nice little feature. All right. Takeoff weight. So we're going to, we will have lost about uh, 4,000 pounds of fuel. Let's see, we took off a 7. And we'll probably burn about 4. So we'll have about 3 on board. So that's about uh, 1.5 kilograms, so kilotons. So we'll be at about 27.5 for our weight. We'll do, you know, I have to do this all over again. There we go. Condition. Let's just say dry at the moment. And uh, wind should turn up, but it doesn't. So it is uh, 100. 100 at 12. That should be fun. All right. 27,500. Boom. Props 850. Flaps 15. Calculate. All right. So we'll make it about 132 for our V app. And 125. And our, there we go. Okay. You know what? Let's make let's make the solid one 125 because let's first of all not do that to our altimeter, which should be standard. And there it is. Um, I have a bad habit of hitting this selector and twiddling this knob. So let's make this 125. Um, just because symbologically this will be hollow while we're still in the air and this is solid. That's the speed we want to hit solid ground at. I know that's weird, but it makes for a nice mnemonic. All right, fuel is good, and you notice how our fuel flow has gone down, and that is fine. Now we can start getting our descent ready, and here's how we do it with VNAV. We, first of all, look for our restrictions. Above 1480 at Bavik, and below 1480 at Iglet, 17 miles later. And our platform altitude, where we're going to start our approach, is 4930. So, what we'll do is we will set 49.30, or as close as we can get, uh, make it 5,000, I'll sell, and that will take us down to there, but no lower. And at the moment, it's not doing anything because we haven't engaged um, a, uh, a descent mode, either IAS, VS, or VNAV. And it won't even let us engage VNAV until we're within uh, range of the top of descent. So that's not even an issue. But if right now we were to hit IAS, it still wouldn't do anything because um, our speed is the same as this. It might drift up or down a little bit if our speed changed very slightly, but um, it more or less wouldn't do much of anything that would get us in any trouble. And if we set it in VS mode, it wouldn't do anything at all because we have no V and vertical speed set whatsoever. So watch, say VS zero, but we obviously don't want to do that because 
then if we nudge a knob, we'll start going up and down. So we're just going to leave it there, not do anything else with it. If, for instance, if I roll off the power here a little bit, we will slow down, but we're not going to go anywhere because, again, we haven't engaged a mode. So we'll program our VNAV and we will tell it where we want to descend to and we will put in our first constraint which is BAVIC enter above 1480 yes boom boom Okay, TOD in 34 minutes. I'm going to shallow that descent a little bit. You see how it says 3.5 degrees? I want it to be a little bit less, so I'm going to make our V-speed. And recalculates. That's a little bit better, and that's fine. And that puts our TOD at 33 minutes. And since our TOD is in about 33 minutes, now would be a pretty good time, I think, to um, cut the video and uh, get back to you a little bit, uh, a little bit closer to then, as we uh, enjoy this uh, beautiful view of where are we? Of a gigantic Chinese city. Let's find out where we are. Probably, probably Dong Shan. Let's see. Are we, let's see, DST? Are we inbound to DST? Let's find out. We are inbound to DST. So that's Dong Shan. And remember what I told you about how massive Chinese cities are? There's Wenzhou. Uh, I will bet you... Let's see. Dongshan, Wenzhou. Are there no airports here? There we go. Okay, so let's, let's just see how big Wenzhou is. Uh, three million people and the area is a population of nine th nine million and when Zhao or it's actually it's actually more like when Cho is um, translates to a mild and pleasant land neither hot in the summer nor cold in the winter I like it I like it I like it and there it is. I am liking this a lot. It's got the seashore. It's got islands. It's got... It no doubt has good seafood. And it has got climate that's probably close to... Santa Barbara, California or something like that. So... Um, how can you complain about that? All right. Well, anyway, enough yammering. We'll uh, we'll pick it up closer to TOD. So, see you in a bit. And we're back, and you can see we are uh, possibly in for a uh, well. We're in for a little bit of a ride. This is uh, this is what it's looked like all the way through. One towering cumulonimbus system after another big old convective masses of moisture and turbulence and ice and hail and vile ugliness. And this is how um, Active Sky 2016 renders it, and it looks pretty damn good. As far as the eye can see, it's all blended out here. It all fades in nicely. Um, at some point, with any luck, SkyMax and uh, 
X-Plane can get their weather act together and uh, do something like this. And maybe someday there will be a mighty dash in X-Plane, but I tend to doubt it. Um, there are offsetting advantages, though, and there is that IXEG 737, which is unbelievably good. So it is fully as good for what it is as this is for what it is. And as you can see right over there is them. And that's a monster. You can also see this is, um, I've tuned in the um, NDB uh, for our beginning of our uh, star, which is uh, Li Xie. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but it's right there. And right after that is our top of descent. And yikes, if it doesn't look like we're going to get pretty damn close to that convective activity. It looks like we're going to skirt just around it to the left. Now, our star is relatively unremarkable except for this. Can't fly north of here. Fly north of here, death. Now, I have no idea, but it is a restricted area, and I don't know why. I'm guessing there's probably something military around there, and let's see if they will say so. I think there is... Let us see. Yeah, this looks like some sort of MOA. And I don't think it has any details, but uh, that is the line we can't cross. Uh, for all I know, we can cross it with, with uh, ATC permission, just like you can military operating areas in this country. But... Um, Military operating areas tend to be sensitive no matter where you go. Take a, uh, take a ferry into Haifa, and it used to be, I don't know if it still is, um, you had to stay inside and not take photographs on the way into the harbor because that was where a good uh, chunk of uh, the Israeli fleet was. And uh, I'm sure it's true in other places around the world. So anyway, we're we're we've got our uh, uh, we've got our ADF pointing to this right now, and we've got our V speed set. We've got our platform altitude set. We have got our VNAV programmed in, and our TOD is going to be in 11 minutes. The other thing that I've done is programmed our HUD, and you have to program the HUD. You have to tell it what the runway elevation is, or the touchdown zone elevation is, and you have to tell it how long the runway is, so it gives you cues for runway remaining, and you also have to tell it whether it's a standard or non-standard glide slope because it changes its symbology if it is. The other thing you have to do to get it to automatically switch into an Approach 3 mode, a Category 3 HUD mode in the IMC condition, is you have to have the localizer tuned in in NAV1 and NAV2, and you have to have the course set properly in the captain's side and the first officer's side. And you can see we're going to just flirt with one of these... Um, storms here, and uh, I hope we don't flirt too hard. What will happen is, if all is well, then the enunciator here will say that it is in an A3 mode. Now, Category 3 is also, um, well, is more than anything, is not controlled by how you configure your aircraft. It's, it, it is determined by um, how the approach is actually um, uh, mapped out and set up. We happen to be flying an ILS approach that only goes to CAT 1. And the reason being is for it to be CAT 2 or greater, there has to be a uh, different restriction on aircraft movement around it. There's a bigger guarded area around the um, any possible 
uh, a position that could interfere with the transmission and the plane's reception of the uh, localizer of the glide slope signal. So for it to even be, for us to even conduct a CAT 2 or 3 arrival, it has to be on the proper runway with the proper procedure. And this runway, as you can see, CAT 1, and there's the minimum, and because it's CAT 1, the uh, minimum, or the minima, depending on, uh, on uh, how persnickety you want to get, because there's more than one, so the minima are in altitude, not in height above the ground. So you do not set a decision height here using the radio altimeter. You set a decision altitude, which makes it incumbent on you to also make sure that you get your uh, altimeter setting correct. And you can see that it's 220, and that is because the airfield elevation is 13 feet, or the t touchdown zone elevation is 13 feet. Add 200, which is the height above ground for the minimum, and round it up to the nearest 10 because you can't set 213 uh, feet, and in any case, it at least allows for the tiniest bit of error to creep into the system. And let's just recheck our weather. And why am I checking here? I should check an active sky because it's providing our weather. So, 2968, so we are deteriorating. Goody. And again, that's very, very important because if our altitude is wrong, we're hosed. Especially if you leave it set too high, it will you, you will think you're hundreds of feet higher than you are, and you won't be dissuaded from that belief until you hear a giant crunching noise. And of course, the problem always with doing things that will crash the airplane is if you are the pilot, you get there first. So we're going to keep a weather eye on these things. We're going to keep an icing eye on whether we're going to have to employ these things. We are turning towards our um, descent fix, which is almost coincident, wow, with, uh, with the name escapes me with uh, Liche. And at the moment, partly cloudy. Now 14 knots crosswind. All right, this is going to get to be sporty. This is going to be fun, fun, fun. Uh, crosswind arrival in this airplane consists of um, crabbing with the rudder cross-controlling with the ailerons, and then on flare, or slightly above it, decrabbing and using counter aileron to, uh, if possible, um, touch down with the upwind main gear slightly lower than the downwind, because if it were the other way around, you would be a lot more susceptible to a gust. Uh, a gust would tend to blow you, rotate you in a very bad way instead of just pushing you down onto the runway. At least I think that's the rationalization, although the cessation of, of the wind could plunk you down a little bit too, but that, that's probably not as damaging. Alright, so we'll scale down a little bit, we'll look at our radar, and wow, we are just missing these. Let's, let's see what we got out over here. Yep, look at, look at this, look at what we're skating right by. Alright. Nice. And we should be coming up on our TOD in four minutes.
And so in a second, the um, the vertical uh, deviation scale will come up. And that's going to be our deviation from our, uh, our descent path. Ideally, it should be zero. And when it does, we can hit that, and it'll plunk us into VNAV mode. We have to maintain, maintain, sorry about that, main, let me try that again. We have to manage speed on the way down. And what we're going to do is we're going to let it creep up to sort of barber pole speed here and just slowly ease off as the air gets denser, at which point we're going to have to reduce the power or our airspeed is going to hit our uh, barber pole as the wind gets thicker, as the wind, as the air gets thicker. And uh, the only beef I've got with this weather is it looks like some of the cloud depictions are a little bit similar looking, but they're not too bad. Like, uh, let's see. Nah, they're, they got some variation. I mean, it would be reasonable that the tops would be blown this way, this way, and this way if the wind is coming from this way, and it is. So it's even accurate to that extent. Unless that's just a coincidence. And the undercast is just is just beautiful. It uh, The forecast is broken, and that sure looks like broken to me. And so far, at least, our frame rates are great. This is... Um, look at how smooth that is. This is... Um, 60 frames per second on average. And this is 4K, so that's not bad. Now, we're not over Southern California with Orbix SoCal, so that's probably a factor, too. And some of this cloud is actually occluding texture, which is probably um, helping us as well. And I don't have sparse grid super sampling on, so that is um, helping us threefold, because uh, when you have that on, what you're essentially doing is you're rendering the frame two or four or eight times, depending on whether you've got it set to two, four, or eight. And so that's two, four, or eight times an entire frame of 4K animation out to the horizon, plus all the work your simulator has to do to make the plane fly, and um, that would be a bit much. Anyway, so there, our uh, deviation indicator is lit up, so we click this, and we see now that um, VNAV is armed, Alt-Cell is armed, 5000 is set, we're still in LNAV, we're still in autopilot. Uh, let me briefly explain before we start going down, also, the HUD. You notice down here, I've got two HUD modes set up, and I can toggle between them, like this. There are other HUD modes available, but I'm not going to plug them in. You put them in by, by cycling this, but... Uh, IMC, which is going to be the decluttered final approach mode, and primary. And let me show you what they look like. Uh, again, some of this is just mainly um, for uh, viewers who are not regular viewers, who are uh, uh, just starting out either with, with my channel or the Mighty Dash. This is the primary display. And it shows, obviously, our slip indicator, as you can see as I adjust the rudder trim. That's our HSI. And I'm just going to adjust the heading. Now, the heading bug is represented here, but also uh, up here, which is off scale, so you can't see it. Here's our crosswind, airspeed. This is our rate of descent, down 1600 feet per minute. There's the range to our next waypoint and which which FMS we're using, and that is correct. Um, and there is our heading bug. Now, 
these two items, the item with the wing is the flight path vector. That will be pointing basically in the direction the carcass of this airplane is going to be going, regardless of what direction the nose is pointing. So if we're nose up and we're stalling, that flight path vector is going to be down here, but actually, you see the little uh, the, the, the V-bar here? That's actually going to be up here. So, hang on, let me just reset our trim here, our rudder trim. Um, the inner ball is the equivalent of uh, the, uh, the airplane, and, and well, it's tells you what direction to steer, and we're over-speeding here, so let me just uh, pull back on our power. There we go. Give it a minute. There we go. Alright, sorry about that. Got distracted. Um... What you do to make this fly, this is the equivalent, this combo is the equivalent of this needle here. Let me just eke off the speed a little bit more. All right, there we go. Um, so when your pink needle is lined up here, that's the equivalent of these two balls being lined up here. Essentially, you fly by matching the inner ball to your flight path vector and you notice we're on a three degree downslope right now. That's this dotted line here because that's more or less what we've set our descent to be. Uh, th this is our mode enunciator just like it was down on our HSI. This represents just about everything um, here. Now, I'm going to toggle the mode to the IMC mode that we're going to be using. I'm just keeping an eye on these storms. We might or might not be able to avoid them. Um, but when we get closer in to land, because we don't want to see all this crap on it, although we, we can land this way. There's nothing stopping us. But it's a little bit busy, so what we do is we would switch the mode, and now you see it says IMC mode. Now you've got your heading bug. You've got your wind vector, which you still need. You've got your descent rate, which you'd like to have. You still have your bug speed. But now, here's your altitude, barometric. There is your glide path right there. There is uh, your uh, attitude indicator, in essence. And um, you have a whole lot less to contend with while you're trying to fly the plane. By the way, this is the horizon. So when we get on the approach, what you're going to see, since this airplane likes to um, descend on final, maybe one or two degrees nose up at most, but probably more like level with the horizon, you're going to see the attitude um, symbol right hovering right about there, or maybe a little bit above it, and you're going to see this flight path vector right down where it is right now on 3.01, which is what we've set. So, that is the name of that tune. Wait, here's our ATIS. Now, we've got ice. Turn on our ice protection, open our doors. Get rid of that. Boom. Now, I'm going to do something stupid. We can divert around this, but I want to see how we perform. <laughs> so, we're going to... Uh, 
you can only do this in a sim and you should only do this in a sim um, we could take the easy way out which is right here but uh, you know I just want to do something stupid in life so we're gonna we're gonna penetrate this bad boy so to speak and also I want to see how the clouds render as we fall out of the sky I guess but all right us versus that all right should be fun and it is leveling us out here because we have to be at 14800 at Iglet. Let's keep our speed up. Our turbulence penetration speed I have not bothered to look up but is probably a, lo a little bit slower than we're going. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna see what uh, see what happens here. I'm also keeping my frame rate indicator up because I want to see what it looks like when we're fully in um, in the shit. Go into our nav mode. I can arm our approach. We don't have to tune it because it's already tuned. All right, get our flight plan up here. And remember that unlike the Boeing, um, it keeps all the old uh, waypoints and starts us at the beginning, so you have to scroll through the whole damn thing. All right, there we go. Let's see what happens. Okay, we're all getting we're already getting up and down draft, so... That's fun. Wow. Now at any minute the autopilot is going to disconnect. I can I can feel that one coming on. Let's see what our frame rate looks like. It's still really good. All right. Any second you're going to hear the bam 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 and the uh, autopilot's going to cut out and we're just going to have to hold on for dear life. I think my passenger signs are on already. Uh, they are, that's fine. Wait! We missed it. Damn! Okay, and really good frame rates. And, and notice, you see how that wispy cloud went by us? That's really damn good. Alright, so... I can't believe it. Solid, strong like bull. Alright, let me just see what our missed approach looks like. First, let me just see if our weather has deteriorated some more. Yes, 2968. Okay, that's where it still is. That's fine. And... Missed approach is going to be a nasty little turn here. And... Climb 2960, proceed to PDL, and except PDL is no longer there. Well, we'll see. And um, probably hold there. Oh, let's see if we have any speed restrictions on our star here. I'm sure we do. Do we, do we, do we, do we? Uh, it'd be nice if I could read it. We do 215 by Lu Zhao. All right. And I'll bet you that's reflected down here. Oh, but you know what? We're getting off the star before then. Oh, wait. And this doesn't show speed restrictions. So... Alright, here we go. So 
So the wind should be significant from our left. That should be fun. At least it'll be from our left front. Such as that is. That's a cool looking, uh, Reservoir, an inland. I wonder if that's an inland harbor, an artificial harbor, like an inland port. Okay. So after this, we're going to be descending to about 8,800 feet, and so far, so good. go faster. Because why not? My uh, my controls are a little bit uneven here. I'm just watching my torques and making a mental note that uh, when we start uh, on our final approach, I'm going to have to have my uh, left hand power lever scooched back about a quarter of an inch get the muscle memory there. Otherwise, I'm going to be perpetually correcting with uh, my rudder pedals. At least it's linear on the way down. See, it's tracking each other. And our fuel flow is actually substantially high, probably because... Well, I was going to say because the prop is freewheeling and turning the engine, but it's a free-running engine, I think. So, there is our airport. Okay, and it's rendering. Just pull off the... lay off the gas a little bit here. Really, really pushing the speed limit. We're going to have to slow down to 250 anyway. That is a big-ass airport. Well, that's LAX and then some. Nice. Okay. But it's too bad. We're going to be visual. No. And that is Shanghai. And that's a... I guess what? That's the, that's the Pearl River? Oh, great. I don't even know. I think that's the Pearl River. But in any case, that is one of the grandest cities on Earth, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is grand in Chinese history. It's grand because it's got a colonial past to it, missionary past. I don't know how the Chinese think about that now, but significant chunks of old Shanghai um, are uh, European-influenced. I, I, it's more or less the Paris of China. Uh, or the New York of China, maybe. Um, Alright, so our local altimeter is 2968. We'll set that now. And you can see we've got a storm kind of in our way. See if we get around it. And we'll retrim because whenever you make power configuration changes in the Mighty Dash, you have to check your rudder trim. Now, because the airport is busy, we are going to keep our speed up to almost 250 knots until we get to where was our restriction point? Until uh, we get to Lijiao. Get up our plate. Alright, so right there we're going to get to 
and we need to uh, be below 215 or below. And I'm going to spin our altitude down now since we've been cleared for the approach. Spin this down to our decision altitude. And those are some serious skyscrapers, ladies and gentlemen. There's a whole bulge in the river there that is home to a colossal number of uh, skyscrapers that simply weren't there 10 years ago. That's how quickly the city is building. And it looks like with all the road and vector data here, that is putting the cramp on our, um, on our performance just a little bit. All right, I'm going to start to slow. because we need to be slowing right about now. But ATC wants us to expedite anyway, so we'll do what we can. Okay, there's 215. Let's just keep it right about there. We're going to start coming down again, so I'm going to have to roll off the power once, once more. And let's look at our localizer. As you can see, that's why I set it up over here, so we can cheat looking here. It can keep our map here for situational awareness. And we can keep our localizer there for... Let's see if we can see it. All right. Take a glimpse at the city. See how badly that hits our frames. That's not terrible. Getting a little slow here. Keep it up. Our nose is riding up a little bit. We know how painful that can be. Not ready to put in any flaps yet. Not ready to switch over from pink needles to blue, which is what we're going to do shortly because uh, we're not flying this as an overlay approach, we're flying it as a real honest-to-God um, uh, ILS approach. We will uh, turn on our lights, and we will uh, chime the flight deck. Okay, done. Watch our speed a little bit. It's crept up a bit too much. Because we started descending, obviously. I'm going to basically make a long base turn here. I'm going to do is set up our props for reduced noise landing. There we go. Done. Check our flaps. Turn on our standbys. And get ready to rock and roll, ladies and gentlemen. Now, at this point, I will slow down to below 200 and put in our first notch of flaps. There we go. Flaps five. Slow down a bit more. And why don't we fly with the HUD here?
That's so I can have a look at my engines. Ah, damn. Alright, well, we'll do that by ear. Okay, so... We are getting ready to intercept our localizer, so we'll pop ourselves into heading select mode for the moment. And... We'll plunk into nav mode now. Oops, sorry. Should be in heading mode, change our nav source. There we go. There we go, okay. That is armed. Just spin ourselves around a little bit here. Get ourselves on an intercept heading. We are slightly below the glide slope, and that's a good place to be. Get ourselves in vertical speed mode, and I can tweak that up and down as I like. And we are now acquiring the localizer. And let's arm our glide slope. It is armed. We've got the localizer. All right. We are DME 16, so we're not going to do anything with the gear or the flaps, and we're going to maintain this speed. Now, as you can see, localizer is coming in. As you can see, we're still slightly below the glide slope. Now we've got it. See, it's blinking. Speed is creeping up because we're going down. So let me just roll off the power slightly. Okay. And we're still lazily coming in on the localizer because... Um, we're a good distance out. We're going down at 900 feet per minute, and that's because we are traveling too fast right now. So let's slow down. And there we go. Let's bring our nose. That was nice. Bring our nose up to about the horizon line. At DME 10, I will drop the gear. And at a DME 10, I think it should declutter and change to... Uh, okay, there we go. That's about right. Uh, this is our power trend, by the way, or our energy trend. As I bring up the power, it moves up. And when we're in the approach mode, it will... Now, notice how it's not changing. If I move my power up, see how that thing goes up above the flight path vector? And this goes down below it. So I really don't have to look at my, uh, my power levers. All right. Let's drop our gear. And now that we've dropped our gear, and put in flaps 10. And notice this is now the, devi the speed deviation indicator. That shows us how far off our VREF we are, and that's our v, v app right down there. Notice how our energy trend is going down, and now it is evening out. And we're dipping down a little bit here because we're still a little fast, so let's roll off that power. Let this trend come down, and I'm going to let that bar drop. going to happen as we get closer to this. This bar is going to get smaller. And our nose is going to climb, and that's about right. And just to cross-check, you'll see that, yeah, we're at about 18-19%. So, alright, let's, first of all, this isn't decluttering as it should, so let's make it declutter. And let's use it as nature intended and fly the airplane. And 
I'm going to put in a little bit of a crab here because of the uh, crosswind. Put in a lot of crab. Okay, we're at 133 knots. Our meatball is centered, but you see it's off to the right. That's because of that crosswind. Okay, we're a little bit fast, but not much. We're descending at 700 feet per minute. That's about right. I'm hard over on the left rudder. Doing a little trimming here. A little bit of an updraft. Notice how our speed popped up, but I'm not changing the power here because it will decay slightly as I keep my nose up. We are significantly crabbed here. As you, as you can see. And we rode a little, uh, little downdraft there. And right now, what I'm going to do get a little power in here and I'm going to clear the HUD and get rid of that get our perspective back here and look at the crab we've got going in here I've got a bad throttle on my right hand side that's never a good thing and we are practically sideways to this runway here look at that Alright, this should be interesting. We're at right about the right speed. I'm doing all I can not not to drift. And also, I've got a right-hand power lever that keeps plunking us to zero. All right, so in a second, I'm going to kick out this crab. There we go. So, it wasn't exactly a soft uh, arrival, but uh, we did what uh, you're supposed to do, and that is we uh, got our um, upwind gear to give it a touch first, and that was cool. And uh, touchdown at, what, 227 feet per minute on the firm side, which is actually what you want to do because you don't want to float. Because if you float, you'll catch a gust, and then bad, bad things will happen. So all things considered, I'll take it. And let's see. There is our terminal.
try our best not to uh, run off the runway. Turn our gust lock on. Off our yaw damper. Bim, bam, boom there. And I really have to calibrate my controls. These aren't my nasty Cytex, but they're not doing me any favors either. These are uh, uh, these are precision flight controls, only they're kind of, sort of, little bit precision, but not really unbelievably so. Turn off our heats. Done and done. Doing a little bit of the old Southwest taxi here. Turn off our radar. And... Taxi into the strangely deserted... Gate... Area. God, look at those thunderstorms. Wow. Not bad. All right, this is obviously not payware scenery, but uh, it's nice. Not too bad. Represents uh, some of the structures as they sort of kind of are. And we've been cleared to cross. 17 left or 17 left if you want to be that way. And I don't know why this right-hand power lever here just kept uh, kept glitching and going to zero, but uh, that was the whistling noise you heard there. It's when I gave it a little shove and it uh, it uh, went down into uh, into beta mode, or it warned that it was going to go into beta mode. So, at any rate, there's no need uh, for you guys to uh, watch me. Uh, park and shut things down, but uh, I hope you got a little something out of this in the way of uh, using the cross-track function, using uh, just programming the FMC or FMS period, um, using the HUD, and uh, doing a uh, crosswind landing. Um, I know I did, and I uh, enjoyed your company as always, and Again, um, subscribe if you like it, and let me know what you think. Give it the old thumbs up, or the thumbs down, or the up yours, doesn't matter. And um, I look forward to hearing um, from, uh, from all of you. And I can't thank you enough for your comments already. So, um, until next time, I'll... Uh, See you again real soon.